phosphorus is the 11th most common element in the world. It helps in the creation of our DNA. It is needed for your body to form bones and teeth. It is also an essential part of cell growth in plants. It can be found everywhere in products like carbonated drinks, detergents and more importantly, fertilizers. Although it occurs naturally in substances such as bone, ash, urine and animal manure, in order for us to keep up with the global demand for phosphorus, it has to be mined. It has been mined for centuries from phosphate rock, a natural and non-renewable resource. There are a few sites along the Namibian coast where large quantities of phosphate rock have been detected on the seabed floor. But mines have been unable to start dredging due to an 18-month moratorium from government. Stakeholders from the fishing industry demanded extensive research to be done on the impact such mining would have, not only on the environment, but the fishing industry as well. We speak to Hans Hochstedt from LL Namibia Phosphates about the outcome of these studies, the economic benefits and perceived pitfalls of phosphate mining, as well as their role in a form of mining that has never been attempted before. So phosphorus is incredibly important to our daily survival. Now this is phosphate rock that contains a lot of phosphorus. With us in studio is Mr. Hans Hoekstedt from LL Namibia Phosphates. Um, sir, tell us, what is rock phosphate? Uh, phosphate rock is really an essential element for all living organisms. Uh, in fact, without phosphate, life will not exist. Uh, now typically in humans, uh, phosphate is really essential for structural material of teeth and bones. Then in plants, we, we add phosphate to the soil. This improves root growth. It also speeds up the maturity of the plant and thereby increasing the production or the crop yield per hectare. Um, interesting, your typical products you find, which is very common use. In the agricultural industry, 90% of all phosphate are used for fertilizer, which is obviously very important for food security on earth. Mm. Then you have phosphate uses, um, which is typically for animal feed, now, this is as food supplements for animal feed. Then you have food-grade phosphate. Now, food-grade phosphate um, is typically used in soft drinks like Coca-Cola. You find it in dairy products, meat, fish products. You have it in soups, sauces. Um, you have it in, in fruits, okay. vegetables. You have it in detergents. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, so this is, it's a, you use it in a lot of products, but it's still a finite resource. It's a non-renewable resource. Um, so just tell us about that. I mean, once it's depleted, is it gone forever, the phosphate that we've got, the rock? Uh, that is accurate. Um, this, this, this element is found in nature in the form of P2O5 combined in, in a rock substrate that you would mine. Once you've mined this, it cannot form again in nature. You cannot make this artificially either. So this is really it's a strategic resource in the true sense of the word. You can obviously recycle phosphate. It's very expensive. But recycling of phosphate through um, uh, human sewage, etc., are being investigated. But it's a very expensive exercise. Very costly exercise. Um, so where is rock phosphate mined in the world? Um, typically on land, phosphate is mined uh, in various places. You have sedimentary and um, uh, igneous, igneous rock. Yeah. That's correct. Mm. And this mining method is open cost. It involves drilling, blasting, excavation. And then offshore, obviously, this is the marine phosphate that we are looking into mining offshore in Namibia. So how does this phosphate form? I know on land, um, it's often deposits between ancient coral reefs and stuff like that. Um, but this phosphate that we're talking about that's lying on the bottom of the seafloor, how does it get there? Now, the element P phosphorus comes mm. from the plankton we have in Namibia in the, the seawater. Okay. There's a huge amount of plankton in the seawater. Plankton itself has a lifespan of a few weeks. Yes. It dies and settles out to the seafloor. Okay. With certain seafloor conditions, zero current and a certain water depth where it can accumulate and supersaturate, then you get supersaturation of element P, phosphorus, and this is where the source of phosphate comes from. All right. And this, um, as you explained to me earlier, this is not the natural color of, of the phosphate rock, which usually be a creamy color. Um, why, is, why is this a black looking rock like this? That is correct. On land phosphate, you typically find it's creamish to, to white color. Mm. Uh, this phosphate we, we have sampled from the, the, the coast of Namibia. It is also actually creamish white on the inside. The outside layer that you see is the black is a bacteria. 
corner. It grows on the water depths of 200 to 300 meters. Okay. And this is what's giving the black color. So this is actually being coated by bacteria as I hold it. That's what that gives it correct. this black color. Um, and then to turn it into fertilizer, what happens to this, this black substance? Uh, the sand, as you see there, the phosphate sand, uh, once we, we've taken that into fertilizer plant, and from that to the fertilizer plant, you get fertilizer. Okay. Now, the whole process is a chemical process. It's technology you have to purchase. It's technology you sometimes have to develop that's true with your own type of rock. And then you have a, a trading commodity of fertilizer that you can export to okay. other countries. So just throwing this in my soil, would that help me at all? Uh, yes, interesting. The, the phosphate rock, as you see there, Yes. Uh, in fact, phosphate sand in this case, mm. um, you can apply this as a direct application as is. It has very high solubility factors. Okay. It's very good for direct application, but it's a slow release. It's a very small market. Mm. So that's also a very good product, but it's a tiny market to reach. And I mean, for, for a country like Namibia that's being stuck now with serious drought problems, um, what would the benefits be of, you know, introducing more rock phosphate into our agricultural industry? Uh, correct, yes. We, we're looking obviously at producing uh, fertilizer, be it the direct application as you see in that bottle, or fertilizer well, yeah. at reduced prices. Okay. As soon as you can drop the price, you start including farmers that were previously not economically involved in the agricultural industry. Yes. Now they're able to afford fertilizer and become part of economic agricultural industry. So that's very important. Obviously in the north you have the green screen project running for, yes. for many years. And then more importantly in the south, coming up with the Neketal Dam project. They will put 5,000 hectares of, of ground under irrigation. And their uh, inexpensive fertilizer will be really crucial to unlock that potential. Now we're actually here to talk about, um, you know, the taboo about uh, mining rock phosphate from the seabed floor. Um, but as you said, there are huge implications for agriculture and it could benefit our economy greatly. Um, so after the ad break, we are going to look at the recent moratorium that was placed upon phosphate mining in Namibia and we're gonna discuss it a little bit further in detail. In 2013, the Namibian government placed an 18-month moratorium on marine phosphate mining, with the Ministry of Fisheries, Bernard Isau, calling it a greenfield project, saying that a moratorium is needed to give time for environmental impact studies before any mining of this nature will be approved by government. The proposed seabed phosphate mining is a new form of mining, and scepticism about its effects on the environment is rife. What does seabed phosphate mining involve? What are its implications on the environment and on our local fishing industry? Watch one exclusive after the break. Mr. Hochstedt, now let's talk about the environmental impact of mining rock phosphate on the seabed floor. Um, there's been a lot of, there was an 18 month moratorium placed upon mining uh, from government. Uh, what was the big deal? The main purpose for the 18 month moratorium that started in September 2013 mm. was to allow government to gain enough knowledge, uh, and this is environmental knowledge, to make sure what environment impacts of phosphate mining would be and then to make a, um, an educated it's, it's, decision. It's, I think they, um, our, uh, Minister Isar called it a greenfield project, meaning that it's not something that's really been done before, a lot of the seabed mining for phosphate. That is correct. It will be the first time uh, phosphate will be mined from the seabed. Ever? That is correct. <laughs> That's quite a daunting task. Um, so understandably for these 18 months, you guys have done you know, intensive studies. Tell me about these studies. Uh, yes, the, the result of all this um, uh, concerns on the environment has led mm. the Ministry of Environment and Tourism to really impose on companies stringent comprehensive environmental impact assessments that they have to do. Mm. An industry conducted and recently completed such an uh, environmental in, uh, impact assessment. And this assessment has been then reviewed by a team of internationally independent renowned scientists. And their final assessment stated that they are impressed with the quality of work done. They mentioned that all uh, concerns have been addressed adequately. And in fact, they are convinced 
that marine phosphate mining will have minimal impact on the environment. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, these are still desktop studies. So there is still, you know, it's really a lot of calculated risk at this stage. Um, could you give me an indication how many people are looking into, you know, going into the phosphate mining industry in Namibia? Um, Allah, I need to um, just correct you. Yes. It was not desktop studies. Okay. Initial studies obviously start with desktop studies yes. and then it follow on to actual marine work. All right. Chartering vessels in the ocean, doing sampling work, doing work on fish survey studies. Um, it has definitely evolved into comprehensive environmental impact assessment. If you think about heavy metals that are being released when you dredge the mud and stuff like that, um, how did you really make sure that, you know, you are taking all these things, all these elements into consideration with a study? Um, most importantly, when it comes to working offshore in the marine environment, um, whilst you're disturbing the sediment of the seafloor, obviously you can create a plume in the water column. The type of method of mining we will use, it's a, it's a pump action, this pump action will suck up the material, very loose material from the seafloor. No material will stay behind in the plume in the water column. Should you create a plume in the water column, obviously the dangers are that this plume will accumulate mm. and this fine sediment will suffocate marine life on the seafloor. So the studies that we've done is really into also the mining technology we will use that will not create a plume of material in the water column. Um, and I, I take it not all the mines that have acquired licenses now have gone to this extent. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on you guys to do things properly. Um, now that brings us to the next question. Out of all these licenses that have been supplied and are submitted, um, what a percentage of that are actually going to, you know, go through government and become actual phosphate mines? Uh, currently there's, there's only two companies that have mining licenses awarded. Um, if you look at the entire Namibian seafloor with all the uh, marine concessions currently, mm -hmm. considering only the areas of potential viable phosphate mining, that will take up less than 0.5% of the Namibian seafloor. Sure. Right. So it's very important to use this and remember this figure yes. because in the impact, you can also use the scale of the impact being very minimal. Okay. Um, and where, where exactly are, are you planning on doing this mining? Uh, the areas of, of the most viable phosphate mining lies between uh, Belfish Bay and Ludritz, between 200 and 300 metre water depth. Okay. Uh, the deposit itself is huge, it's really large on, on world scale. Uh, we're talking about a life of mine of over 500 years. Sure. Um, and uh, there's going to be a little view, uh, video that will show our viewers later about the process of dredging. Um, but the idea is also not that you're taking kilometers of ocean floor at a time and stripping it. You know, you are doing it very sustainably. Um, explain a little bit about that. Correct. Um, the method of mining here plays a very important role. Mm. And during the development of the technology with the technology providers, we've also incorporated our approaches towards the environment. Uh, one aspect, for instance, we will mine the top 30 centimetres of the seafloor. That means what remains behind is the same material as what we removed. Okay. Therefore, marine life can continue to exist in the same habitat. Uh, so you, only, you uh, only scrape that much from the bottom of the ocean floor. So it's really not, not that big a deal. It's not like you're scraping huge kilometres of soil off the bottom of the ocean. And as I said, the important thing is we leave behind the same material as what we take. Mm. Uh, because of the size of the resource being so huge, we have the luxury to selective mine. In other words, within a mining block, we can leave behind, and this will be the mine plan, we leave behind undisturbed areas as well. Okay. Therefore, it is not 100% cover of removing the material, and it also will allow marine life to easily um, exist and, 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 and proliferate in the areas next door to the areas mined already. Thank you. I'm going to go into another small ad break and then we'll talk a little bit more about rock phosphate mining. Extensive research points to the continued preservation of our Namibian coastline. Proposed offshore mining techniques for phosphate rock show very little impact to the marine environment. In addition, there seems to be very little evidence that the world's phosphorus supply is under threat. However, rock phosphate can only be put to its full use if it has been cleaned and stripped of foreign matter. Processing phosphate to strip the phosphorus to its purer form produces phosphogypsum. 
One ton of phosphorus product can produce up to six tons of phosphogypsum, a waste product that is difficult to store or reuse. Next up, Hans Hochstedt from LL Namibia Phosphates shares with us how they have solved the problem of these unusable byproducts. Welcome back, viewers. Um, now, Mr. Hochstedt, just to look again at the environmental impact, once the rock, face, rock phosphate has been mined, um, it's not water soluble, it's not really, in most cases, ready for any type of consumption. Um, and the big thing then again is um, the byproduct that it produces, something called photogypsum? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, it's phosphogypsum. Phos phosphogypsum, sorry. Uh, the word phosphor coming from phosphate, phosphorus, obviously, obviously, that means yes. there's remnants remaining in the gypsum. Yes. Now, this particular technology use is to make your merchant grade fertilizer. Okay. Now, one of the byproducts, in this case, in the normal technology that people have been using for many, many decades, mm. that produces phosphogypsum, which is actually a waste. Yes. And with this waste, you produce huge amounts of this. This will accumulate in huge stacks that you have to manage over, over the years. I think one ton of uh, uh, rock production is like six tons of, of uh, phosphogypsum. That is accurate, like that? depending yes. on technology, but that is accurate, All correct. Right. Okay. So you have these huge stacks. It becomes mountains of phosphogypsum. Yes. The problem is in the phosphogypsum, there's also your heavy metals. Mm. Therefore, it becomes an environmental uh, challenge to really manage this yes. and not have an impact on the environment. Luckily, in the technology we'll be using in Namibia, it is very recent technology, it's environmental friendly, in the sense that it will produce pure gypsum. Okay. Therefore, not a waste, but a byproduct. And this pure gypsum can be used in the building industry, typically for ceiling boards, uh, drywalls, plaster and cement. Okay, so you are taking the waste product that is usually the biggest problem with the mining industry and you are using it as another product. So you are making sure that there's really very little left behind from this process that is, uh, you know, bad for the environment. That is correct. Uh, this technology was also developed over many decades because of environmental issues and challenges that the fertilizer industry have, have um, had over the decades. Now, according to the University of Columbia, the chances of us really running out of rock phosphate anytime soon is very slim. Um, there are still discoveries being made all over the world. Um, so really, the next question is, I mean, who's going to be benefiting from the mining? It's all great to say, you know, we'll make fertilizers and solve world hunger. Um, but will all this, you know, profit or all these good things be trickling down to the local economy? Yes, uh, we're looking at the phosphate industry. Yes. This industry itself will have a capital investment of a staggering 40 billion Namibian dollars. Sure. That's money spent in this country. We're looking at an annual GDP of 10 billion Namibian sure. dollars. Okay. Then we're looking at direct taxes and royalties, 1.7 billion dollars per year. This excludes uh, pays you earn taxes. Um, you might know the figure. You know the national unemployment rate yeah. is 28%. And national objectives are to reduce this to below 5% within 14 years. And this is where the faucet industry will play a significant role in providing employment. And employment, uh, typically the following types would be during construction period of three years, 4,000 employment. Then once operation starts, you're looking at 3,400 sure. permanent employment. And then indirect employment, uh, typically support industries, hospitals, schools, uh, logistics, retail etc. Um, uh, your, your mine's quite close to the harbour there, so I hope it's not all going to be put on ship, ships and sent overseas and we won't see, see any of our own rock phosphates in Namibia. Um, so will you be, you know, directly supplying your product to our market as well? Correct. Um, it will be the first avenue would be the local market, domestic right. being Namibia and the rest of the SADA countries. Um, therefore, it will be the more inexpensive fertiliser and more readily available to your farmer that was previously not economically involved yes. in the agricultural industry. Thank you so very much for joining us in studio. Thank you for the time. Sure. Great viewers, for your comments, SMS us at triple five. The following footage was contributed by LL Namibia Phosphates for the purpose of educating the viewer on seabed phosphate mining. The operational part of the project starts with the offshore mine support vessel deploying the mining tool. Once the mining tool has landed on the seafloor, the slurry hose connecting the mining tool to the surface 
will be connected to the empty or transport barge via a bow coupling. Once the bow coupling is secure and in place, mining can commence. The mine support vessel will start steaming slowly forward whilst pulling the mining tool along the sea floor, while the dredge head starts pumping the top layer of phosphate ore through the slurry hose connected to the ore transport barge. Once the transport barge is full, the slurry hose will decouple and the next empty barge will come into position. Here the transport barge is shown coming alongside the import jetty. This port facility links the offshore operation to the on-land fertilizer facility. The facility consists of the mechanical beneficiation plant, power production plant which uses a steam turbine generator to produce and distribute electricity to the entire plant, the sulfuric acid plant, and excess electricity being transferred to the national grid, the phosphoric acid plant for the final product and the export facility. On-land fertilizer production will start with the import of the phosphate ore from the transport barge to the dewatering ponds. The production of phosphoric acid also requires import of sulfur from an offshore supplier to the on-land sulfur storage warehouse. The first stage of processing will start with mechanical beneficiation of the phosphate ore to produce the white shell oversize and the dark phosphate concentrate. Each of these intermediate products is to be stored on their respective stacks. The shell will be processed through a milling plant to produce calcium carbonate powder. The following inputs will be fed to the phosphoric acid plant, rock concentrate, calcium carbonate powder, intermediate products and sulfuric acid to produce the final product of concentrate phosphoric acid. This final product, phosphoric acid, will be pumped to the storage tanks situated at the port facility. From these storage tanks, the phosphoric acid will be pumped via the export jetty to a chemical tanker for export to international markets.